So welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. I am Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor and I love conversations and I love research and not as much the editing of the podcast. So we are posting um, 2021 interviews before 2022 happens and here's one that's really cool. So today's guest is Mary Elizabeth Kent. She's a quilter. She's designed a ton of quilts. She's written books. We also talked to her about um, Gwen Marston, who was also um, a super famous quilter who really impacted the quilting world in terms of her liberated quilting, um, had a lot of um, uh, retreats, um, wrote books, and she wrote, she passed, she passed away in uh, April of 2019. And Mary Elizabeth wrote a really cool piece about her experiences with Gwen and her memories. And so we wanted to talk to her about both um, her work and also that of Gwen Marston. Hello. Hello. How are you? Thank you. Did we have to reschedule this? Am I right remembering correctly? You, you are. How are you? Yes, so we had a bunch of them here. I don't know what they, they're tearing up the streets. Um, and I think that they just do something weird because suddenly like there's sometimes there's a storm and it goes out and sometimes it, there's no storm and it goes out. So I don't really understand. It feels like we live in a Caribbean, um, well, I'm in New Orleans. So right. we always say that we're in a Caribbean city because, you know, sometimes the water works, sometimes the power works. <laughs> You have a beautiful campus, though, I have to say. I was there in 2018. Yeah, you were? You at Tulane? I was I was in New Orleans, and I went to the what? campus to buy my oh. dad's sweatshirt. Oh, that's nice. Well, thank you for being willing to reschedule. As I said, life is complicated. It is. Um, okay, cool. Um, so we're going to go for about 20 minutes, a half hour. Um, we're just going to talk about you. And um, it's super simple. Um, the first question is very easy, which I know the answer to, which is tell us your name and where you're calling from. My name is Mary Elizabeth Kinch, and I'm calling from Toronto, Canada. Ah, so I love Canada. I like, I aspire to be Canadian. I love Canada. I just love Canada. And I, um, you know, where I love is um, Hamilton, Ontario. Okay. Isn't that weird? So my research work was there, um, I, the papers that I had to do research on, and I was coming from LA at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was like this lovely, I know you, you Canadians don't think Hamilton is like a cool place, but coming from LA, it was like, you didn't, it was shockingly lovely. <laughs> so. Hamilton is lovely. It's, it's evolving. It's changing. It's evolving. Yeah. So Awesome. Um, tell us your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life. Oh, knowing that that was the first question, I've been thinking about it a bit. Uh, yeah. And it's it's mixed. I remember going with my mom to to for a dress fitting for her. She was having a double breasted coat dress made back in the 60s mm. with a pillbox hat. Oh. And I remember I remember that woman's sewing area and just being fascinated by it. But my first memory, so I didn't see her sewing, but I saw the the um, after effects of, of someone having yeah. and but my first memory is sewing with my mom as she was making curtains and she taught me how to um, make pillowcases and I drove that sewing machine like it was a Mack truck, like pedal to the metal. <laughs> I, I, like I, that. That. I like that. It's funny. I was sewing with a friend yesterday and we're making stuff. My kid's going off to college. And so we're making a bunch of stuff for them to go off to college. And it just brought, we were talking about sewing with mom and sewing, like there's something about like, whether it's a Halloween costume or curtains or whatever it is that like, there's something really, this like special time um, that is really, we were talking about that. We were kind of recreating that, you know, our, our moms aren't around anymore. So we were like, oh, look at us, we're doing like that. So I don't know, I think we don't talk more enough about that, that sort of the dedication of moms to do stuff and the, what sewing meant, um, you know, it was really, whether the moms sewed or didn't sew, there was a lot of moments where it was like, okay, well, I don't know how to do this, but we're making these curtains, right? So um, I don't know. I think we've lost that a little bit um, at this point. You know, there's more of a like, let's go look at Amazon and see if we can find that dinosaur costume for you, so. Or we feel there's a bunch of rules we should be following when we make it and there's right. less um, 
intrepidness to just let's just jump into right. it. And it's not that fabric was necessarily less precious than if anything, it was more precious. Yeah. Because it was sometimes harder to find or um but I, I just feel these days that, that people want to know how to do it right. Yeah. And that like, oh, well, I'm not a sewer. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that was the issue at that point. I think that everybody, not everyone, most women found themselves sewing at some point mm -hmm. because it was something that had to be done. Um, some did it more than others. I, I get that feeling um, and that it crossed socioeconomic lines, all kinds of things that it wasn't, it would be like, well, I need to learn how to type, right? Like we all type. So we all, um, I don't know, it's an interesting kind of thing. I know not quite why we're here, but I just think it's interesting that like, I don't know. I don't think there's the same thing at this point. I think we just don't think about it that way. It's a specialty um, as, as opposed to a necessity. Um, so. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. But let's keep going. Uh, so tell me a little bit about, I mean, I know a little bit about you, but tell us a little bit about sort of what you do and um, your stuff is really cool. And um, I don't know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's start there. Okay. Um, so I'll start at, back at the beginning with quilting, seeing as quilting is the topic. I, totally. I, I grew up in a house where there weren't any quilts on the bed or any quilts on the walls and there weren't any quilts really in the houses of any relatives either. Um, I slept under uh, two wool blankets and an English eider down um, and, and a, a Quebecois woven coverlet. So I, you know, lots of warmth, but not of the quilt variety. But I knew what quilts were because my parents were um, avid antique collectors and we would go on weekends to auctions, you know, old farm auctions. And um, I would go with them to antique shows and antique shops. So I'd seen quilts, I knew what they were. And when I was 16, I had a job as a historical interpreter for a number of summers at a, a, a place called Black Creek Pioneer Village, and um, which we lovingly called the village for short. And the village is a, a recreation of an 1850s, 1860s crossroad community in Ontario. They gathered together, oh, I think probably about 50 buildings from all over Southern Ontario to recreate this village. And my job as an interpreter was to work in full historic costume and demonstrate the daily activities of pioneer life. That's so, really cool, at 16? At 16, it was That's like the perfect job at 16, right? It was like, amazing. You know? I got to bake uh, bread in a brick um, bake that's oven and so cool. spin and, and dye wool and weave. And that's where I learned how to quilt was the, the more senior members at the village taught me how to quilt. And they were incredibly, incredibly patient with me. My stitches were very large. I don't know if they took them out after I left, but I, 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 I got the bug there. And that's where I hand pieced my first quilt together when, is, I, when I worked there cool. it was a really really fun job and it was also um in those old homes because they were dressed in the period I got to see quilts antique quilts in their native habitat so to speak and and that really forged my love of antique quilts just to see them in that environment I still have such vivid memories of walking up the stairs and in, in the halfway house in the inn and um and going to the bedroom on the, you know, turning to the left-hand side and it was a red and green applique quilt and it was just a stunner. It took my breath away every time I saw it. So that's, that's that where really my, cool. my love of quilts really started. And I've, I made quilts after that off and on. Um, and honestly, in about mm, late nineties, I was almost ready to quit. Um, Why? <sighs> The rules were coming into play and the way things had to be done and and I was running into problems and people were saying you have to take classes and there wasn't um, that same spirit that I had found at the village of just the people who would be around to help more. It's so I had, weird. I mean, the village thing. So I'm looking online. I so want to go to the village. But what an interesting experience to be in a recreating space with people that were teaching you how to. I mean, like that's such a amazing. you know amazing, so unusual. Okay, so then you get the '90s. You get the ridiculousness. You get the rules. You get the the rotary cutter. You get all these things yeah. being 
like the commercialization and that explosion happens yeah. and you yeah. find that it's you're not in that you haven't been taught in that world that that's like there must be an incongruentness to like your experiences mm -hmm. and what's happening in that kind of modern space is that right. which is and, that what you felt exactly and it, and it's it's not that I, I belonged to a guild at the time and I was taking classes and I was I was meeting other women who were quilting, but I was just finding that there was a, a staticness to what I was seeing and it just wasn't striking my heart. It wasn't speaking to my soul until the day it was February. And I can remember dropping my daughter off at um, kindergarten. Uh -huh. so about that precious two and a half hours, right? Yeah. And um i i went and parked in front of the local quilt shop climbing over a snowbank that was like thigh high deep and you know trudging my way into it was snowing quite heavily that day into this quilt store and um wonderful shop that has since closed and when you walked in the door on the left hand side there were books right in front of the cash desk and i can remember on the right hand side of the shelf halfway up there it was, Gwen Marston's Liberated Quilt Making. And I picked up that book and I thumbed through the pages and I went, oh, this, yes, Great. this, right. yes, this. And she came to our guild a, a, a couple of years later. I took both her classes. I went to her lecture and I signed up to go to Beaver Island on the spot. It was the last year it was actually gonna be held on Beaver Island. And I, I really wanted to experience it there because it was moving to the mainland. And I've never looked back. Gwen opened up doors for me. I wouldn't be the quilter today if it, if it wasn't for Gwen. And so help so, us understand, because I think you made, you did a tribute to her. Is that right? Did you write a piece about her at I some point when, after she passed away? I or did. After, yeah. After, after she passed away in Curated Quilts Magazine. Yeah. Um, help us understand who she, so we've been writing a book on medallions and we got to Liberated Medallion book. and. I didn't realize I, when I saw it, I was like, oh, right. Like I had her first book, right. But I didn't even like, you know, you, you get kind of sidetracked, but she was so important to the quilting field. Like it is, so, she is like a, an anchor point in a really important way. Can you help us understand who she was and sort of just help us understand who she was? Okay. First of all, I have chill bumps. Um, and uh. thank, you for, thank you for those kind words about Gwen. Um, she was an anchor point and not just for the modern quilt movement. She started quilting back in the 70s. Uh, she had seen um, an exhibition of quilts, I think, in Flint, in Flint, Michigan or in Detroit and came home and, and made some quilts for her kids um, and really loved the process. And she and her family moved to Oregon, I believe it was. And when she was there, she saw a newspaper article for a quilt show that was going to happen. And so she got in her car and she drove to it. And she recounts being so struck by the quilts at the quilt show that she was overcome, just totally overcome by what she saw. They were draped over chairs on top of tables. Um, and it was a group of Mennonite women. And uh, she said she had to leave, but I, you know, asked, I think, if, if she could come back. And they said, yes, come back and we quilt. And so they taught her over the next year. They gave her an absolutely solid foundation in, in quilting. And then her, she and her family moved back to Michigan and she came in contact with a woman named Mary Schaefer. And she likes to say that um, Mary Schaefer picked her up where the Mennonites dropped her off. Mary was an incredible um, quilt historian and quilt maker and, uh, Mary taught Gwen all about antique quilts. And I I'm trying to remember at what point she started writing. I know she wrote for a time for Ladies Patchwork Circle. She had a regular column in, in that publication and she started holding her quilt retreats and started teaching around, um, around the US and then eventually to um, Japan and then New Zealand and Australia and and all over. And I think the most important thing that Gwen, the message that she had for quilters, her her trademark is liberated quilt making, um, which uh, encompassed taking blocks and 
taking lessons that she had learned from old quilts about points not matching or things being a little bit off um, and taking those same lessons and incorporating them now. And so she called them liberated stars or liberated log cabins. Some people call them wonky. Um, and she started that in, in the early nineties, really playing with those lessons. I think sometimes people can maybe get too fixated on the liberated block aspect and really what she was doing was liberating the quilter through those blocks. Right. And right. Her, her idea was that was about creativity and women being able to make work that was original, original and their own. And that can be incredibly rewarding. And yeah. so that influence, you know, before that, when she was writing her articles in, in ladies patchwork circles, she was talking about how to do borders and how to, how to do different settings. It fascinating stuff that people were gobbling up. And I think it was partly the way she delivered it in a very approachable, very manageable fashion. Um, but I, I know a woman, um, a friend's grandmother who lives up in um, Fort Francis, Ontario, far north in, in Ontario. And when she heard I was going to Gwen Marston's retreat, yeah. she was practically beside herself. Like her, her span was far and wide. And but her, her deep commitment to helping encourage women, men, quilters in general, to find their own quilting voice was huge. And she did it in a way that was incredibly empowering. And, and I, I think back to one quilt retreat that I was at. Um, I knew I was going to start teaching. Uh, it was just after the first book I had written with my writing partner, Biz Storms. And a new quilter came to the retreat, came with a longtime quilter, a veteran uh, retreater. And she came through the door and she had, and she's so nice to meet Gwen and she was talking. She said, look, this is the pattern I brought. This is the quilt I'm going to work on. And this is um, the fabric I bought all to match, like perfectly match the pattern. And I can remember Gwen standing there going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the structure of the retreat yeah. is that she would pick a topic like medallions or strippy quilts or string quilts. And she would have, over the previous year, made 20 examples to share with us. And she would talk about all the interesting things we could do. There would be 25 of us at the retreat. And then at the end, there would be 25 unique quilts on the wall that spoke wholly of the maker. So interesting. You get it was that from the liberated medallion book. I'm so, and it's so fascinating. What I found about the medallion, what drew me to that book and to reaching out to you was um, I loved the sort of spirit of the book that it felt like like you, you could imagine you all at retreat at the retreats that you, there were conversations going that they were super uh, happy. You know, there was a, a joyfulness to it and a respect that you could feel in the book um, mm -hmm. that it was about um, here's some ideas, here's what's going on, all of that. I also really love that on with that book she starts with. We we're working on um, understanding that one of the uh, Martha Washington quilts, and mm -hmm. she starts with that as a beginning of like look she's liberated to like she's not perfect either and there was a sense of like um the history like the connection to history but not being um I'm a historian by training and a lot of times people treat history like oh well that's like what you were saying about like there's rules and like history we have to sort of push ourselves into that and it was more that that liberated hold on just a second I don't know why so there's no emergency um uh that there's um I don't know, which is cool. You know, like I, I was like, I want to know this person who is no longer here. Um, but I thought it was, and, and I guess I want you to talk more about, I have a thousand questions, but the other thing that sort of struck me is I look at like Maria um, Shell's work. I look at a lot of the improv quilting and I, I see her influence in everything that we don't even realize how much um, that sort of like, the people that are doing it may not know why they're doing it, that that it's it's sort of expanded in this amazing way. Um, did she feel that? And do you all do you feel that as well when you look at quilts, sort of the influence of her? Um, 
Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Can I backtrack for a second? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that student that came with the matchy. Yeah, match oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. What happened in the end, I, I, she was sitting right behind me and I thought, I'm just going to pay attention to how Gwen handles that. Her, right? Right. I'm gonna pay attention right. To right. How Gwen teaches her. The yeah. thing is, Gwen never taught her in quotation marks. She, she would go up and just make suggestions. They'd have conversations. It was so open and supportive. And at the end of the week, the weekend on, on Saturday night, when we had show and tell, there was not one trace of that original pattern there. It was a total original on the wall and a quilter who was beaming from ear to ear. That's amazing. And that to me was quintessential Gwen, that she had taken somebody who was in a place of of so much um, uncertainty and fears, maybe too strong a word, but just not courageous in a way to try something so outside of their box and that she could do that yeah. in five days. I think it was partly the atmosphere in the room, but also yeah. it, she created this incredibly, incredibly safe place to create. And I think that's what I've seen as an influence in her work going forward. When you see work today, it doesn't have to look like Gwen's liberated blocks. Right. To be liberated. What's happened is the quilter inside has been liberated and they have a comfort level with experimenting, with trying things, with, with stretching out. So do I see her influence in the quilt world? Absolutely. Hands down, all over the place. Really cool. Yeah. I like that. I really like that. How did it influence um not I not only your work but your method of teaching do you feel like that the, do you see those lessons in how you could you give workshops and lectures as well so I'm curious do you does that live on in you that kind of absolutely, absolutely. and that was that Gwen wanted people to carry on and and teach she was not um she did not hold them close and clutch them. She was giving it widely to the world and she encouraged so many other people to teach. And there's a, a few of us, we laugh and we say we're part of the liberated school of quilt making because it's so profoundly affected our work. And so I do talk about her and it does, it's part of my work. I couldn't not really be liberated going forward. It's, um, and it comes I mean, in your great. work isn't right your work isn't I mean just so people know like if you go to your website which is um uh Mary Elizabeth Kinch k-i-n-c-h um mm -hmm. dot com it isn't like you go there and go oh well that's liberated quilting because your work isn't that it's that I mean you do lots of different things so even though the spirit is there it isn't that you're mimicking the no. you know at all um no. so help us understand what you mean by that Ooh two quilts come to mind. One is the one that's behind me, which I think you can yeah. see for listeners. It's um, a quilt called the Foothills Quilt. Uh, and during many, many conversations with Gwen, she would be sitting in her house in, in Michigan. I'd be sitting on, uh, in my house in Toronto, we'd be on the phone and we'd have the same historical quilt book out. And we'd be looking at a quilt and talking about all the things that we were seeing that we liked about it. And I, I learned how to study a quilt, antique quilt in depth from her, um, how to look for all the different nuances and uh, quirks and things that made them interesting, that whole opposite of static that I was feeling before. Yeah. Um, and so with the Foothills quilt, it's, it's a study of a late 1800s uh, Canadian antique quilt. And I did a quilt along about three or four years ago. And everything that I learned from Gwen about how to how to look at value and fabric replacements, like substituting fabric in. Yeah. Uh, so it, there's a, a section in that quilt that's three flying uh, three flying geese segments, uh, units. And when I looked at the original quilt, she'd made all these neat fabric substitutions. Um, it's learning that stripes can go in all different directions; they don't have to go all in the same direction. It's um, Oh, lessons that I've learned from Gwen. If something's too long, cut it off. And if it's too short, add a piece on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it, they were exercises in, in loosening up and in taking a leap really to, to 
I mean, sometimes you have to muscle your way through something, as she would say, but it was it was taking that leap. So that's those are just some of the of the lessons. And I I think that that quilt struck a real chord with people because it has the Foothills quilt has all those interesting elements into it. Um, the other quilt uh, is the fallout quilt which is the one that um, was on um, at the Vermont Quilt Festival this year and it won best quilt outside of USA. And it's this, this one, which I think you can see. Oh, it's really great. It's uh, very, it's got a lot of circles on it. Circles um, with a lot of dots, uh, applique dots on it, then with um, applique circles in the background. And um, uh, so I learned, I learned how to make berries from Gwen, the, the dots. Um, and that quilt came out of two things. One is uh, at the time that I was going through my divorce, I had no creative mojo whatsoever. The only thing I could do was make berries. So I made this huge, like big Ziploc bag full of berries. Just, I would, her method was to cut a circle, gather it, and then put it over your finger and draw it up and then squish it down. And that's how you, you make a Gwen berry. Um, and I had this huge bag and I had another girlfriend who was just saying, I can't wait to see what you're going to do with them. I can't wait to see what you're going to do with these berries, which was really encouraging for somebody who was not feeling very creative at the time. I took them to quilt retreat one year and um, just being in her environment and just her, her attitude and talking about creativity you have like little brain synapses that go off an idea of like, oh, this, and I could do this. And what if I did that? And I had the idea to um, take a square of fabric, lay out a parameter. And she showed me how to mark it without a ruler or without a pencil line. And then just, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jackson Pollock paintings, but he would drizzle paint on things and, and splatter paint on it. And I thought, I'm just gonna toss the berries on and where they land is where they're gonna get stitched. And I did it and it was kind of a hot mess, but it was, the, it was the basis for fallout eventually when I made that one. It was taking that idea and refining it a bit further, but she created that safe environment. So I, I think I've lost a little bit of the thread of your question, but I don't know. And I think it's it. really interesting. I, you know, I'm a law professor. And so I'm thinking, I have this long-term project, which is the role of law and creativity. And where we are in the project is what is creativity? Like you can't really understand what the law is until you understand that process of creativity. And it really made me think about when you were talking about that of the need for a safe environment or the need for space, you know, room of one's own kind of thing or need to create. It was interesting. And that that was what she was helping people to do is find spaces and the confidence to feel comfortable to create that part of what happened with the 90s movement is restriction and not feeling comfortable to create mm -hmm. and that that she provided a sort of a breath of fresh air is that am I am I no I, I don't think you're off base there a lot of us used to refer to so she the retreat ended up being I think five five different um, sessions in September and we would call that the start of our creative year I, it, we would go and come home just totally jazzed to rejuvenated to keep sewing and keep creating and now with these retreats was it the same people going each time like did you all get it was it ran, like how tell me a little bit more about the retreats themselves there was um a number of students who came every year who came together as groups sometimes it would fluctuate if there was a wedding or you know some big event going on that that somebody right be able to make it but there were sort of people that were there every year and then there were new people and and she was also wonderful in that regard of saying now I'm going to sit you at this table here <laughs> and knowing how personalities would work well with one another and and, oh, and I made some of my dearest friends are from from that retreat that's really cool it's very cool yeah it's funny because there's so much sort of retreat, retreat, retreat all the time and retreat centers and it feels much more structural mm -hmm. than creative sometimes. Not that I'm anti-retreat, but I'm just saying that like 
it seems that there's some people I think about a few people that people are really following that they go to their, their courses and all of that. And this seems very much like it was more than just like, let's get away to sew. It was uh, a creative space to come together to really think about what your process was and who you were and what you wanted to do. Is that very much so is that accurate? So. Yeah. Without a lot of talk about process and what you want to do, like it, on the like, so it wasn't so heady that you would get intimidated. In there was a, a naturalness and an ease to it, and that's what I hope I take into my classrooms with yeah. when I'm teaching now. Is that same safe space to create and to try and experiment, and yeah. um, because that's what I value value the most. And I think in terms of creativity and quilting, um, it's very easy with all the books of quick and easy this and, you know, the make it in a weekend or there's certainly a place for that. I know that there are times where I have wanted to create, but I didn't want to be creative. And so I, I did I did need right. to have that kit because I needed to right. knock out that baby quilt really fast. But, right. but having, having us, having a space for creativity, having space created and safeness yeah, is huge. It's absolutely huge. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, you know, with the copyright stuff, I talk about puzzling, like it's totally fine to get a kit and make the kit because you're, experiencing the artist or whoever put that kit together that you want to be in kind of their um, creative space. And if I make this kit, I'm like, oh, wow, look at this is like, you get to experience that. Like when you make, when you do a puzzle, right? Like there's Mm -hmm. nothing new about it, but you enjoy that moment. And we can't be mean to those who want to do that. I do that. I like doing that sometimes. Absolutely, there's a place for it. And then the other side of it is the creativity. I find it's what's really interesting, like that completely creative. And then there's like kind of in the middle, right? Like, well, right. I like that kid, but I, or I like that pattern, but I change it or whatever. I think what I think is really interesting is the pressure. Here's my new pressure. First, the pressure to be really complicated, both the quilting, like the quilting to death groups, and also the like little teeny tiny pieces or the, um, the very complicated quilt, you know what I mean? Like those super like, uh, Dear Jane quilt's a good example, right? So mm-hmm. all of these sort of projects that are like, look at how amazing I am. And for mine, I really have come to be like, I really like very simple quilts. I like very simple, like I'm, I like the cleanness of them. I like, you know what I mean? Like I just enjoy doing them. I enjoy looking at them. And I feel like, and not necessarily modern quilt, like I'm not trying to be cool and hip. I'm just like, it's, I feel like it's hard to not be judged or not be self-judging. Um, and I think that from when I'm reading about Gwen, that that was really important to her to not have you looking outward, that it was an internal creative spirit experience as opposed to what, how are people gonna judge me on if I use blue with this green? And I feel like the outward pressure to be labeled or to be complicated is really great at this moment. That it's, it's hyper. Does that seem, accurate to you uh, um I absolutely accurate on the um the judging and I think social media has made that even terrible right harder horrible um, right? I, I'm I'm the social media person who goes on and and likes the first 20 pictures and then I'm gone and I might not be there for another four days yeah I can't hang out in that space personally yeah um which is ironic because that's where I do most of my communication with people. Right, your job. Like, it's your job. It's exactly. part of your job, right? Yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. Um, and I think it's just another variation on that 90s perfection, 90s rules thing. It's hyper. It's like this hyper capitalism. I mean, what the ni- the capitalism in the 90s is nothing compared to 2020. Mm-hmm. And I feel that way with the so- with quilting world as well, right? Like, everything is push, 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 push to this crazy, crazy degree. Um, yeah. I, I made a decision about four years ago yeah. that all of my projects would be me driven as opposed to other driven. I like that. Um, 
it's very easy to get asked by a lot of people to oh, can you can you do this for for me i have such and such product you'll get lots of exposure and it got to the point where as i was being asked to do anything more for exposure i would be naked <laughs> i just i yeah, couldn't I mean, do it anymore and that's a killer of creativity in a way yeah. since i've since i've made that shift i've done work that i've been more connected with that i have been more um gratified by yeah in my in my practice in my creative practice oh, than i did beforehand yeah i get that so i did the kind of the same thing again i'm not you i'm like i'm just a regular culture but with the podcast like it got weird really quickly first i stopped accepting free products um and that i didn't want to have to be an ambassador or use somebody else's stuff. It was interfering with my creative space. Mm -hmm. Oh, now I have to use Michael Miller's fabric or, oh, I have to, use, I'd rather, no, I don't want that. Yeah. Second, I decided, and not all the time, still I do social media stuff because, you know, that's part of the world, but there's certain situations where I think, all right, you're not allowed to post about this and you're not allowed to talk about it. And how does that change the nature of the project? And it dramatically changes the nature of the product project. If I say to myself, nope, even when you're finished, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to post. This is not about that. This is about you. And I'm very disciplined with myself and make sure that I like, nope, nothing like this is just, and it changes it. It brings it back to that pre, that pre social media space of I'm just doing this because I love it. And because I want to be creative and it, it brings it, that outward world is so pushing on us all the time um, that you have to figure out these means to keep it out because it, it interferes. I mean, it, it, it fuels creativity, but I think it also interferes with it that you've got these, you feel like all these people are looking at you as you choose which orange you're going to use. Um, and I think that's problematic. And again, I go back to the retreats and sort of what I've read about them. And it feels like that wasn't what that was about, that it no. was a space. No. I think I think retreat is a convenient word to use to describe the gathering of women that happened. Um, but it's not an accurate word for what was happening there. It's different than a retreat where a group of women gather from a guild and we're going on retreat and they each bring their own individual project and there's no theme other than they've gathered together as women in a right. building, right? This, yeah. this was very different in... It, and yet it was a retreat on the one hand. It was almost from, feels from like a, it was from a, a very study. soulful experience, right? That, yeah, like, it feels like you were, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm super excited you're here. So I, I often get overly excited. If it's here from you is that the retreat wasn't just a retreat and it wasn't just a class, but it was that, you know, you had one person that had studied it for this long period of time. And then you were all coming together to sort of think about whatever it was that you were thinking about. And that to me seems incredibly interesting um, to really, to be engaged in the, the creative process, but also really thinking about what it means in that particular genre, whatever it is. Also, as I think about it, what was happening in the room at the same time were 25 people on the same topic going in different directions. So there was an incredibly wonderful creative, creative synergy that was happening in the room. There were not people like, you know, um, oh, now she look what she's doing now, what I'm, I'm going to do that. Everybody right. stayed, at the, stayed in their lane, so to speak, of what, where they were at creatively. But it, it was just so much fun to see, to see where everybody went with one idea. There's a lot to be gained from different perspectives and also the different skill sets that people bring to, to that conversation. Yeah. When I, uh, so there's a, an Indiana quilt maker, her name's Susan McCord and the Henry Ford Museum has, uh, I think 13 of her quilts at this point. Her most famous is the vine quilt. And uh, the vine quilt is Oh, I'm gonna, I hope I get this right. 13 different muslin panels separated by two inches of uh, double pink um, sashing going between them. It's a long strippy quilt. And uh, on each of those panels is an undulating vine. And off of the vine are all of these string piece leaves. It is 
and uh, it's an American um, treasure. It, it's a masterpiece. It's phenomenal. It hands down my favorite quilt. I had the great fortune to be able to study it for um, about an hour and a half, one day, two hours. I went to the museum and the things I learned from that quilt about her tenacity, um, things that I never could have gleaned from photographs. Uh, really just cool. Very, yeah. very cool. She used now, it, different types of thread to, to applique it. I mean, the quilt police would be up in arms. Right. She, she did a, a very unique way of attaching the vine to deal with the fact that she was using binding on our um, the bias, the strips that she had made for the undulating vine were done on the straight of grain instead of the bias because she was short of fabric. Some segments are only two inches long. Again, something you can't gather from the photograph. Right. It's, the thing, it was fascinating. I'm looking at the, it's beautiful. I'm looking at it now, which is again, Susan McCord and then to put vine quilt in it. It's at the Henry Ford Museum. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. It is very detailed. And it's all incredible. Of those, and it's right. all hand piece. There's somebody suggested at one point, one of the curators there, that that um, they had made strata yeah. uh, strips of fabric and then cut out the leaves. No, it's all hand pieced. If you'd done that, you would have undone your hand stitching. And when some pieces are only, you know, an inch wide, then trying to needle turn that under. No, it's it's all hand pieced. And there's no repetition that would indicate strata. That this, these conversations are bigger than this one quilt. Uh, and, and thinking about all of that, yeah. And I think when you're looking historically at quilts too, it's important to understand our quilt history and where our quilt heritage came from. And, and so the roots go back to, you know, medallion quilts, or as they're called in the UK, frame quilts, or um, right. that's where the roots are to them. Um, right. And those difficult conversations, as you say, we're having the same, starting to have the same conversations here with, um, the effect of colonization and and quilts are symbolic of that. And you can't talk about antique quilts in Canada without also considering the effects of colonization and the horrific and tragic experience of indigenous people who did not have the same experience as um, yeah. as settlers did. That's right. I totally, yeah, exactly. I mean, these quilts tell us stories that they're hard stories sometimes and <laughs> to, um, and, I think we're ready for that. I mean, we're not ready for it, but we are ready for it. And it's a moment to, to really confront our history and to really think about our history and not just put it aside, you know? Exactly. exactly. So. And, and quilts, I think people often want to see them as only in a happy light or a cheerful light. Not that there isn't a place there for it, but the realization that, that quilts people have such an interesting, strong connection to quilts. I've always found it fascinating that I was crossing the border one time and, and the young crossing guard was very, very young, like Doogie Howser young. And he said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to a quilting retreat. And he goes, oh, you make quilts? My grandmother made quilts. And he's like, totally not right. or customs officer, you know, at that moment. Right. And it's, so you, you get that such a strong attack, you know, right. attraction to it. But when I've been studying Canadian antique quilts and realizing that, you know, when those, when those settlers came to this country in, in the 1830s, 1840s, there was no, there were no woolen mills here. There were no mills here producing fabric. Everything either had to come from the UK or come up from the States at that point. And so, a lot of the early quilts in Canada, and our history here is much, much younger. We did not um, form into a country until 1867. So, um, but when those settlers came, they, they had to make, they had to keep warm and they had to make do with what they had here. And so flax grew very quickly. And so they would um, grow flax, but it would take two years to get sheep um, old enough to be at shearing age. And then they would shear the wool and they would um, either on a community loom or if they were lucky enough to have a loom in, at, at their home, they would weave fabric to make into quilts for the bed. Uh, so most of the early quilts in Upper Canada were made of um, wool or woolen, uh, woolen linen combination. And, and that, that was necessary for warmth because otherwise you're, you know, the home was built for shelter, yeah. the quilts were made for warmth. And I think that very, very deep connection as well, like that 
that can't be um, overlooked. And I, I think that the romanticization of quilts yeah. often just wants to look at the happy part or it was women's way of expressing themselves. And all of those can be true, but right. there's this other very fundamental need that was being well, fulfilled. It's so interesting. And, you know, the thing that I see with the Martha project is, I mean, all the other problems aside is the almost the belittling or the like, oh, you made a quilt that sweet, right? Like you you look at Susan McCord's quilt and you think that is a lot of time and a lot of expertise and to dismiss it as, oh, that's cute. Or, oh, she, or my grandma made quilts, right? is really to dismiss women in a really, in, in really terrible way. Um, and with Martha's quilts, Martha is one of those people that gets dismissed, like, oh, she was that old woman with that hat on, right? And so it's very emblematic of sort of what happens to quilters, that, you know, our artistry and um, the time, this concept of time um, is so important that we are giving history a, a lot of our time to create these pieces. Um, and so thinking through that part of it as well is really important um, that, you know, we, we only have time. So yeah. if we choose to make a piece that is, um, you know, again, memorializing a component of our life in a way that will outlast us potentially. So I don't know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. There um, is a lot there. And I think it's, it's a, what you're touching on is a, a larger issue in the industry that exists today. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, I think it's always been there, but I think it's hyper. My husband studies a lot of cultural capitalism stuff. That's what he does. So we have these conversations quite a bit and it's emblematic of who we are as a culture. Um, it's just that we stitch it into fabric. So it becomes like, it's visible. <laughs> it's like the, you know, the, the issues are very visible, um, which is really interesting too. I don't know. Well, I am, in, I don't think we went for 20 minutes. <laughs> Let me see what the time is. Uh oh, I'm sure it's not 20 minutes because, you know, that happens. Where are we on time? Oh, 50 minutes. You know, we're not terrible, but that's not terrible. Yeah. Um, so I just love chatting with you. And, and this is such a great thing. Um, we haven't even gotten to, you teach course, if people are listening and they think you're amazing and I think you're amazing, um, you teach courses and workshops and, and all kinds of things so they can go to your website. Um, and um, thank you for your time. I want to um, chat with you after we chat, after we stop, but um, thank you again for talking and, and um, talking to us about Gwen. I think that legacy, how you keep that legacy, she's so important. I'm sure there's lots of people that like feel that way, but how do you keep that part of it alive? How do you keep that as part of the history of quilting? Um, and maybe that's already happening, but it, what did strike me is like, her books are not just books. That was, it was an important component of the history of quilting and who we are today. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you chatting about that too. Thank you. All right. Um, do you need to review this before we post? Um, that's my little hat. All right. Hold on. Just so you've been listening to the Just Want to Quilt podcast. This is our fourth season. Our fourth season. Craziness. Um, come join us in our Facebook group. We have tons of fun there. Um, you just enjoy the group. Um, answer a few questions. It's awesome. We also are starting TikTok. So if you like that space, come join us there. Um, we're kind of on Instagram. We spend some time on Instagram. We're not as good about that. Um, and I don't know. Come play. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you get a chance to quilt today. <laughs>